Folks, my name is Melvin Covington, Pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, and welcome to my kitchen, ta to my dining room table, I should say. My wife is right across the table from me, and if any of you have children, uh, after we're done with the sermon today, um, when I log off, she's going to log on for a children's message to share with her kids. I just finished listening to some members of our praise band uh, singing a few songs to give us worship. If you get an opportunity, uh, catch the video if you haven't heard it already. But there was a phrase in the last song uh, that went something like this, blessing in the brokenness. Yeah, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's not what we look for in life. We don't look for brokenness. We don't look for having uh, downhill experiences in life. But it's very biblical. If you turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 5, while you're going there, if you get there quickly, also go to Revelation 21. Because we're going to step from Matthew 5 to Revelation 21. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus climbs up on a hilltop and he's teaching the people. He's the rabbi. And he's come to share with them. And he's going to say something to them that is this odd thing, this counterintuitive thing. Just verse 3. Matthew chapter 5, beginning of the Beatitudes. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I just pause for that for a moment. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That means the valley comes before the victory. It means the hurt comes before the hope. It means emptiness comes before being full. Now my heart landed on this this week because of where we are with all this social separation and things that are happening in the economy and what landed in my life is because of a verse like this, because the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that this pandemic, this brokenness, can be reinterpreted by us as Christians as a blessing. Because it takes us right to the edge of a paradox. And today what I want to unpack, and what's on my heart, is to unpack this paradox of Christian life. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, I can't be in the physical presence with my brothers and sisters in Christ, but that doesn't stop your word. You said the gates of Hades would not prevail against your church, so I don't believe a virus is going to prevail against it either. And Lord, maybe this is an opportunity for your church to be more than just meeting in a building, but to really be out in the midst of its community. Loving people, sharing hope, being light in the dark, being salt in the seasonless times. But Father, we're respecting the health of other people by not gathering together physically, but we're gathering together socially by a, a mechanism that you've allowed us to have by this internet. And Father, I'm grateful for it. While I, I say I've been drug kicking and screaming into this time because I'm not a millennial, I'm more a colonial I do appreciate the opportunity to speak to those that will listen and to share with them what you put on my heart. So, Father, as I pray Sunday after Sunday, I pray that you just pour into me and I'll pour out and withhold anything of me that would end up in this and don't allow me to hold back anything that's of you. But, Father, I don't want to stop there. I want to pray for the health of a nation. I want to pray for the health of the world. And beginning with the fact that I pray that they recognize their need for Jesus. And then, Father, as they find forgiveness of sin and life in Christ, that you would heal us of, of this virus. I pray for those in leadership that are having to make some hard decisions, that you give them strength and confidence. Father, now as we go to your word and go to your truths, would you meet us here by your Holy Spirit? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn with me to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, beginning verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun 
or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of the Lord illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The Bible tells us that in the future there's a holy open city, uh, a place where there isn't going to be a virus, a place where there isn't going to be social distancing, a place where there's going to be victory, a place where there's no need of a sun or a moon or a light or uh, any other kind of light, because the Lamb is, is a light. That is the glorious future for us in Christ Jesus. And for anybody listening to this that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that is what's available to you. But I don't want to focus so much on the victory of the future. I want to focus on the individual that heard that revelation. I want us to draw down to the prophet who received from Jesus what the future is to be. <clears throat> according to church history, John is the recorder of Revelation. He's the one that received it. And according to church history, he received it not while he was in a church sanctuary, not while he was in the normal course of life, not while he was enjoying things as a senior saint of the church, one of the last remaining to have walked with Jesus physically. John received Revelation when he was in exile on an island off the coast of Turkey. And according to history, his exile wasn't hanging out on the beach. His exile was locked in a cave to where he couldn't even exit, but he could just look out over the sea. Can you imagine what John was dealing with at that point in time? Imagine his fear for his family that he couldn't communicate with, he couldn't touch or see. Imagine what John was dealing with uh, in wondering about what was happening in the church and was the gospel going to be stalled and stopped? Was the church going to be consumed by the pressure of the time? Imagine him not being able to greet one another with a holy kiss or a handshake. It was an enforced quarantine, an enforced social distancing. And he would have been overwhelmed by so many words. To the outside view, John had lost. To the outside view, he couldn't do anything to do, affect anything externally. He couldn't do anything to change the circumstances. It was this quarantine we're in on steroids. But that was the very place, folks, where the vision of the rock walls gave way to the vision of a holy city. That was the place when a person who was in a hollowness, received a holy vision. That was the place where John saw gem-studded walls and foundations with the names of the apostles. That was the place where, instead of being a victim, John was shown absolute victory. John's hollow time actually likely became his most holy time. This is the oddness of life with Christ. This is the oddness of uh, a godly life. This is the oddness of the way we approach the kingdom of heaven. But it's written all throughout the scriptures. Think about Abraham. Before Abraham called out that the Lord is a provider, he was called to put his son on the altar. Before Joseph was able to secure a place for the, the 70 uh, of Israel's family, he had to go through slavery and go through prison and go through the pit. Before Mary was going to be the virgin mother of the Messiah, she had to endure the threat of being stoned and divorced. Over and over we find this. Before Elijah was going to have a, an intimate communion with God, he had to run for his life from a Jezebel. Peter and John had to leave their nets before they were going to be in the presence of the living God. Matthew had to leave his tax table. Paul had to be struck blind. It's the expansion after limitation. It's great vistas 
through cracks in a jail cell wall. The Christian life, the journey of Christian life is really a great paradox. Emptiness makes space for fullness. And it's not a journey we would choose on our own. Now, it's, use the illustration of a bell. What makes noise from a bell is really a, its hollowness. If you take a bell and stuff it full of stuffing, it doesn't make any noise. It doesn't live up to its design. And in my own testimony, I can really see that effect. I was baptized at the age of 12. There was uh, that verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that those who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And, and that captivated me. And at the age of 12, I gave my life to Jesus and, and wanted him to be my Savior, my Lord, my friend, the one that loved me. But shortly after that, circumstances happened in life that I didn't go to church. Uh, and I began to fill my life with other things. I was going to school. I was working for a local farm. Uh, at 15, I met my wife, started dating her through high school. We would be married when I was 18. And my daughter would be born a year and a half later. I was putting things inside the bell. But then about the age of 20, everything was going well and right, and I just felt there was something missing. And I started to read the Bible. And I started going back to church. And I transitioned, or the Lord transitioned me, instead of John 3.16, while I still have it memorized, still believe it to be absolutely true, a different life verse was given to me. And this life verse actually came from Genesis 5.24. If you got your Bibles handy, flip real quick all the way to the other end of the Bible from Revelation, Genesis 5.24. And this single verse reads this way. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That became my life verse for that season of my life. I didn't realize it, but God had drawn me right to the edge of the paradox. That to walk with God means walking right out of your life. To have the fullness of God, to have the holiness of God, you have to have the emptiness of self. You have to have the hollowness of yourself. You have to make room for Him. You see, emptiness creates space for fullness. There's this individual in the Gospels who comes to Jesus. Uh, Luke tells us that uh, he's a ruler. Matthew tells us he's a young man. Mark shows him running to Jesus in Mark chapter 10. If you get an opportunity to turn there, Mark chapter 10. So here is a young ruler, very familiar, anybody that spent much time in church he comes running to Jesus uh, and he's a serious fellow he's got a serious question in his heart and all three of the gospel synoptic gospel writers say this uh, here's his question good teacher so he's respectful of Jesus good teacher what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life and see even though uh, he was a ruler even though he still had his youth even though he recognized Jesus as a good teacher. He wasn't settled in life. He wanted assurance. And I could just imagine this fellow picking off every biblical teacher that he ran into to find out, have I checked every box? Have I crossed every T? Have I dotted every I? Have I done everything so that I can be sure that I have earned a relationship with God? So I have earned the blessing of life with God, because eternal life is not just time, it's quality of life at the same time. So this was the man's want. And so Jesus met the man where he was. That's often what we find with Jesus when he's dealing with people. Uh, he meets them where they are. And Jesus says, you know the commandments. Uh, Mark ten nineteen. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. This fellow was way past most. Many of us would scratch our head at that point and say, okay, I've got to go back and check that box and 
mark that uh, cross that T. But he didn't say that. Uh, he looked at Jesus and teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus doesn't correct the fellow. So we make an assumption. We can assume that all right, the fellow had been a good, good law keeper. He's been an upstanding citizen. He, he would be one that you would make a leader in your church, a deacon, because he knows the laws and he keeps the laws and probably carries the right Bible and doesn't drink coffee in the sanctuary or any of those other things. Jesus looks at him, verse 21, looking at him. Scripture also says, loved him. And said to him, one thing you lack. This is what the fellow needed to know. This is why he came to Jesus. He wanted to know that he had done everything he needed to do so that God would owe him holiness. And God would owe him blessing. And Jesus said, go your way. And do what? Sell whatever you have. Give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. What is that but emptiness? Look, emptiness creates space for fullness. Just let go of it all, is what Jesus says to him. It's only one thing left. You've kept the laws. You've done all that good stuff. You, you're being respectful to me. You've done all of that stuff. One thing. This is it. Here's the tipping point. You do this, you've got treasure. Give it all away. When I read this this week, I wondered, is this why it's so easy for children to come to Jesus? Because they have left stuff. Their life isn't full of so many things that the world offers that they can say, with honesty, here I am, fill me up, because their bell is still pretty hollow. But the older we get, the more stuff we stuff in the bell. And the more we deaden that life. Oh, we want the fullness of God. We want the blessing of Christ. But we really don't want to pull stuff out of the bell. This goes all the way back to a garden problem. In the garden, the devil told Adam and Eve, you know what, just fill yourself. I know God said some things to you, but fill yourself. Take this fruit, uh, and ever since then, he's been offering the bounty of the world to fill the bell of our lives until we're so stuffed that we don't have any room for the fullness of God. And we try all we can to avoid hollowness. We try all we can to avoid emptiness. We fill our lives with television or internet or we fill our lives with recreation we fill our lives with career and uh, sexuality and our looks we fill our lives with all types of pursuits with drugs and alcohol with camaraderie with all those things we fill our lives with all of that it's stuffing in the bell and a bell can't ring when it's stuffed and when your life is full of the world your life can't be full of the treasures of heaven This week, my wife gave, uh, brought me dinner, and dinner was Italian sausage with peppers and onions. I know you're hungry now, right? Y'all are missing donuts and sausage biscuits, but that's the way it is. We're quarantined. But after that, she said, do you want a piece of blueberry pie? And I said, sure. <laughs> I told somebody this week, my wife is accustomed to cooking for the masses. Now she's still doing a mass of cooking for one individual. But she said, do you want me to put the pie on the same plate? And I said, sure. And then I thought, no, I don't want my pie dumped on top of the juice from an Italian sausage and peppers. You see, what I wanted was a new plate. Because I didn't want anything to mess up the taste of the pie. But do we do that with God? If you're anything like me, what you want God to do is dump the blessing he has for you, the dessert, right on top of the heap of the worldly things. You just want him to pile it on top so you can enjoy it all. But God is holy and the things of God are holy. And he's not going to mix holiness with unholy. There's a call to emptiness. 
When David was forced as a middle-aged man to run for his life into the desert from his treasonous son, David used that empty space to be filled by God. Psalm 63, 1. David said, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. David didn't say, God, give me water. David didn't say, God, give me the throne back. David didn't say, God, remove my treasonous son. David said, God, I want you. Because emptiness makes a place for fullness. In 2 Corinthians, Paul celebrated his weakness. Now we try everything we can to not show weakness. Real men don't cry. Pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But in 2 Corinthians 2.9, Paul said, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Weakness makes room for strength. It's a paradox. And he goes on, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities. He says, I'd rather celebrate my brokenness. I'd rather celebrate my emptiness. I'd rather celebrate my hollow hollowness. I'd rather celebrate the prison times of my life that the power of Christ may rest upon me counterintuitive. The world has wired us for a different direction than this. So the young ruler, he receives this message from Jesus, one thing you lack, give it all away and you'll have treasures in heaven and come follow me. But Mark 10 22 says, but he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful. And most of us know what comes next, for he had great possessions. He had a lot of things in the belt. Without emptiness, he had no clear space for the fullness of God. In the 17th century, there was a fellow who worked at a religious community by the name of Brother Lawrence. And Brother Lawrence chose to live intentionally empty in life. He had the lowly job of washing pots and pans in a religious community but he used that empty time as an opportunity to spend with the Lord. It, it was a holy time for him. The, the kitchen sink was a sanctuary. And the interesting thing is people sought out Lawrence because of the peace that they found in his life. And Brother Lawrence said that God has this continual flow of grace that comes like a torrent. Yet we often stifle the flow of abundance by not valuing it. Now, Brother Lawrence had a whole lot less things to occupy his time and attention to be distractions than what we do today. So maybe it was easier for him in that time than it is for us. But it is still an applicable paradox. What we put in the bell of our life is what we value. And unless we develop the habit of emptying we will destine ourselves to a sad life, just like the ruler. Oh, it might be filled with activities and possessions, but it won't ring the way it was designed to ring. It'll be a stuffed bell, deadened to the life that God would have you live. Listen, God the Son said, Luke 9.23, Luke 9, 23 and following. Listen for the paradox. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, that's a blessed life, right? It's life with God, life with Christ. Comma, let him deny himself. That's the emptiness. And take up his cross, hollowness, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. It's a paradox. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? 
Fullness comes after emptiness. And this is why it's so easy to miss. And for those that realize it's so hard to get a hold of. Have you ever been in a checkout line? I know some of you have been chasing after toilet paper this week. You get in the checkout line, and when people took their kids to the stores, there would be all of those things that would grab their attention in the store line. All the candy, all of the, the little simple gifts, and kids would say, Give me that. Can I have that? I'd like a Snickers bar. I'd like a, uh, some kind of gummy bears or something. And good parents guide their offspring. You know, they, they don't allow things into their life that's going to do them harm, and they reduce things in their life that are distractions. If your children come home from school and their grades are slipping, you might tell them they're going to have less TV or less internet time or they're going to have less time for recreation because you want them to focus on the better thing of their grades. Now, if we as earthly parents do those kind of things for our children's well-being, is it any surprise that God would do the same for his children? We find in Deuteronomy 8, verse 3, these words. So he, God, humbled you, allowed you to hunger. Let me, let me back up again. Let me start this again because I know you might have been turning to the verse. Deuteronomy 8, 3. So he humbled you. God humbled Israel. Comma, allowed you to hunger. God allowed them to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. God humbled his people. God allowed his people to hunger so that they might know he was the source of blessing. He's done it before. He's done it multiple times. The discipline leveled against Israel through Assyria and Babylon wasn't just to destroy them, it was to discipline them back to a relationship with him because they had been caught up in all kinds of idolatry. Folks, from this vantage point, from the awareness of the paradox that emptiness brings fullness, from the fact that God has before used brokenness as an avenue for blessing. We can see this pandemic a different way. Instead of seeing it as something that is taking away our life, we have the wonderful opportunity to see this as something that opens us up, empties out our bell to make room for the fullness that God would pour in that we might ring. This pandemic, this, this virus, this quarantine, this social distancing, this solitariness actually brings us right to the edge of the blessing paradox. If we would just take another step in and begin to pray, Lord, fill me. Brokenness brings the presence of God. Brokenness, emptiness is surrender to God. When we come to the end of ourselves, when we lean in for God, He steps in. Martin Luther, a long time ago, said, God creates out of nothing. Therefore, until a man is nothing, God can make nothing out of the man. Listen for the paradox in this familiar verse. It's spoken so many times at gatherings where people call out to God in prayer. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. God is waiting. He's made a promise. He's made a promise that if we will be empty, He will be our filling. If we would be poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven would be ours. 
He's waiting for your emptiness. Now, I know this paradox is contrary to the way the world works and it's hard for us to handle. And there's so much stuff that is stuffed into our lives. And we ask this question, because it is a paradox, how in the world could emptiness ever bring hope? I know it's a few weeks early, but I think about it every Sunday. I want you to think back to a moment 2,000 years ago. When friends of Jesus made their way to a rock tomb to tie up some loose ends for their friend who had died on the cross. They were grieving, they were overwhelmed because so much of what they had expected was ripped out of their lives by the brutality of it. And we get there, when they get there, they find the stone has been rolled away. And their grief is compounded because when they look inside, where they expected to find the body of Jesus whom they loved, they found emptiness. And now in their minds, there was salt rubbed in a wound because someone had stolen the body away. I imagine they didn't think they could go any lower than they had already gone. But the missing body made them go even lower than that. A hollowness, a brokenness, a valley time, a victimization. But folks, it was at that very moment of utter emptiness. It was at that very moment of despair. It was at that very moment when their life was so out of control. That the word Mary, from the resurrected Jesus, sent a shockwave through humanity. Overwhelming hope in Christ came from utter despair. One of the greatest acts of God's holiness came from absolute human hollowness. Emptiness made space for the fullness of God in Christ Jesus. So as I close, are you running on empty yet? How about instead of grieving, grieving your loss any longer, Grieving that you can't go someplace. Grieving that you can't hang out with the people that you want to hang out with. How about you take this opportunity as a gift from God, as a prelude to fullness? How about we as a church stop saying, woe is me, and start saying, victory in Jesus? I thought I was empty, but boy, that's just, just some room being made in my life. And let me pick up my Bible and begin to read. Let me watch worship videos online. Let me listen to sermons that are out there. Let me call a neighbor and tell him about what I just read in the scriptures. How about we let God pour in? <coughs> At the end of the Bible, the Holy Spirit calls out. Revelation twenty two seventeen. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of this life freely. Emptiness makes way for fullness. If you have a relationship with Jesus, let him fill you more. Take this as a wonderful opportunity to have room for him in your life. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, folks, I hope you realize that this virus is just an evidence of how fragile our life is. How quickly the things that we fill our life with don't have value. But Jesus proved victory over emptiness. And the resurrection of Jesus proves that there is nothing that can take him out of your life.
And if you feel called to surrender your life to him today, I would encourage you to close your eyes now. Admit to him that you're a sinner. And that you're calling out to him to be savior by dying on the cross for your sins. And not only do you want to be saved from the sins in your life, but you want him to be Lord of your life. You want him to be master. You want him to fill the bell that you can ring with Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that emptiness is not the end. But just like you use the brutality of a cross to bring salvation to the world, you use emptiness as a reservoir for fullness. Will you pray often, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, but Lord God, we don't often make room for that kingdom to come to earth. So Lord, thank you for the blessing of a pandemic that's making room in our lives. And Father, I pray that you lead us in faithfulness to use this as a wonderful opportunity to have more of you and less of ourselves. More of heaven and less of this world. And Father, I pray, I pray for the day that your church is going to gather physically again for that glorious opportunity to greet one another with handshakes and hugs. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for being here. And in just a few minutes, my wife is going to come on with a children's message. I pray that you have a wonderful week. Fresh blessings. We'll gather on Zoom this evening. Uh, and those of you that have contacts with me, if you don't have the Zoom contact information, just text me and I'll send it back to you. Love you all in Christ.